AP Biology Chapter 39, Plant Response Part 2. In Part 1, we talked about auxin. Remember, auxin elongates the opposite side that's um, furthest from the light, and that causes the plant to bend toward the light. Here we have the meristem area. This is where auxin is produced. So if you cut off the tops of the plant, or the tips of the plant, or the roots tips, then you're going to have no more auxin produced, and it's not going to be able to bend toward the light. The correct answer. Cytokinins are the second type of plant hormone that you need to know. You don't have to write down the top here, but you should write down the bottom part. These uh, cytokinins, cyto means cell, control cell division and cell specialization, like plant cells becoming uh, storage cells for starch or mesophyll cells that have lots of chloroplasts. They also enhance apical dominance like auxin, so you should know that. Auxin and cytokinins enhance apical dominance, which means that we're going to have the plant growing more up and down and when you chop the tips of the plant then it grows more sideways. When you prune a bush and chop off the tops of a bush that chops off the apical meristems which causes a bush to grow sideways which is what people want when they're growing like a, a, med, a, a hedge maze. The correct answer is C. Gibberellins are the third type of uh, plant hormone that you should know. They are involved with cell um, stem elongation so making the stem longer. Uh, here's the easy one to remember, fruit growth, but seed germination. Germination G, gibberellins G. Germination is the seed sprouting. So remember, gibberellins are involved with seeds. Now one thing that's missing from your notes from the previous class is what this little part here is called. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and sketch out a seed here, and the little bottom part I want you to label as the radical. Radical is spelled R-A-D-I-C-L-E, and the radical is the embryonic root that will become the root. So let's write that down. Radical becomes the root. And remember Gibberellin's seed germination, GG. Gibberellins are not involved with um, phototropism, but they are involved with fruit growth, stem elongation, and seed germination. Racinosteroids, they're similar to auxins, and they're involved with cell elongation and division, shoots and seedlings. Seedlings, that's all you have to know. Write that down. Abscisic acid. Think of someone with an acid personality as being kind of against something, and that's kind of what abscisic acid's all about. It's going to slow growth. It's not going to encourage growth. It's kind of like an old person, you know, saying, oh, there's too much new stuff going on. Let's slow things down. It also is going to keep the seed in dormancy, prevent it from uh, germinating. So imagine we have a seed, and the seed has large amounts of abscisic acid preventing it from growing, keeping it dormant, keeping it in like suspended animation. And now you're in the environment, and now a rain comes. Now, if, if the rain um, happens, you want that seed to germinate. So uh, nature has devised a method where the rain washes away the abscisic acid. The abscisic acid was causing the seed to be dormant, so now that the seed is no longer exposed to abscisic acid, the rain washed it away, it's allowed to grow. And if you remember, one of the effects of gibberellins is that um, once the abscisic acid is uh, washed away and preventing that seed from being dormant, the gibberellins take over and cause it to germinate. This is good because you don't want your seed to sprout unless you have uh, good conditions like nice moisture, light temperature, so that's a good thing. This is also involved with drought tolerance, rapid stomate closing, prevent from drying out. So think of abscisic acid as like an emergency response to a bad environment, keeping the plant from uh, uh, either sprouting, if the conditions aren't right, or in the adult plant, prevent uh, water loss. A, abscisic, A, against, that might help too. Remember, auxins and uh, racinosteroids work together. Alright, ethylene is an interesting one. It's a gas released by plant cells. And uh, write this down. It has three responses. It slows stem elongation, it thickens the stem, and curves the st uh, for horizontal growth. There's also another um, uh, thing ethylene does. It's called apoptosis. We'll talk about that in a second. And the biggest thing is fruit ripening. So let's underline that. Alright, apoptosis and leaf abscission. So what ends up happening is in the fall, the um, uh, ethylene will cause the apoptosis or cell death of the cells at the base of the leaf and cause the leaf to fall off. Now it's good because the leaf is going to lose water during the winter. So if you can lose your leaves during the winter, 
that means you can prevent water loss during the time when you're not doing much photosynthesis. So leaf uh, abscission, let's write that down, is when the leaves fall off and that's caused by ethylene and then the ethylene um, basically will create the uh, signal transduction pathway for the scar tissue to form to prevent more water loss. Apoptosis is un uh, planned cell death. Remember we had apoptosis between our fingers to make our distinct fingers. All right, here's something interesting. Let's write this down. Fruit ripening, hard tart fruits pr protect the developing seed from herbivores and a birth of eth ethylene triggers the ripening process. So if you really want to uh, have your apples or bananas ripen faster, just put it in a plastic bag. The ethylene will build up and it'll ripen a lot faster. It's a positive feedback system, and you should write that down. This is a great example of positive feedback. As more ethylene is produced, we have more ripening, which produces more ethylene, which produces more ripening, so forth and so on. If you don't want to have your apples or bananas ripen, and this isn't true of all fruits, just uh, many fruits, then you um, you know at the store you have bags with plastic uh, plastic bags with holes in it. The holes allow, or those nets allow that ethylene to escape. All right, you can read this. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch because the ethylene produced by the bad apple allows the other ones to ripen faster, which um, causes them to spoil faster. But if you want to ripen your food faster, your bananas or your apples, then uh, just put a ripe, uh, ripe apple or banana with the things you want to ripen. High CO2 storage uh, reduces ethylene, so a lot of stores uh, store their fruits uh, in CO2 to reduce ethylene to keep them fresh longer. answer is D. Remember, auxins are A. All right, so let's uh, review these six hormones, and this is the major content for Chapter 39, plant response. All right, we have some other things that we have to know for Chapter 39. Um, photomorphogenesis just means light changing uh, and creating stuff in the plant. Light detection, intensity, direction, wavelength, uh, all this stuff you don't have to write down. However, red and blue light have selective advantage because green light doesn't really do anything for the plant because chlorophyll doesn't capture it. All right, this is the another thing that's a little bit complicated. We'll talk about it now, and you do need to write this down. A short day plant is a plant that um, will trigger flowering only if there is a long period of uninterrupted dark. Okay, so if there is a short period of uninterrupted dark, less than 12 hours, then the plant doesn't flower. But if it has a long, uninterrupted night, short day, the plant will flower. That's what happens with short day plants. It only flowers during the time of the season that uh, it's going to spread its pollen. However, if there's any break in that dark period, like a flash of light, it doesn't flower. So it has to be uninterrupted dark. Another way of saying short day plant, and you should probably write that down, is that it's also a long, interrupt, uninterrupted night plant. That's actually a plant. Just remember the long day plant is the opposite of a short day plant. It has to have a short night in order for it to uh, flower. Here we have short night, long night, doesn't flower. And then we have short night because it was interrupted by a flash of light. You should know the difference between a short day plant and a long day plant. Let's go and review that now. Is there a flowering hormone? We can uh, do an experiment with this. If this plant is flowering and then we uh, combine the, the vascular tissue of the two plants together, the one plant that's already flowering can trigger the other plant to flower, letting us know that there was some chemical being sent from one plant to the other to cause them to flower. Circadian rhythms are internal 24-hour uh, cycles that plants have. Morning glories, glories open up their uh, flowers in the morning, and uh, the exact mechanism of how circadian rhythms happen is unknown. All right, last, or one of the last things we have in Chapter 39. How does sprouting shoot know to grow toward the surface from underground? How do you know what's up and what's down? The answer is um, gravitropism. Gravitropism is movement in response to gravity. And inside the root cells, we find these little stadoliths. So the roots exhibit positive gra gravitropism, or movement toward the roots, or the ground. Shoots experience negative gravitropism, or movement away from the ground. 
Statoliths are little tiny rock-like substances within the roots that settle toward the bottom, and you can see them over here. And as they settle to the bottom, they're in dark blue here, they trigger a single transduction pathway that causes cell elongation in the roots toward the dirt, toward the center of the earth, toward the source of gravity, and in um, shoots away from the gravity. Make sure you understand that. Statoliths, gravitropism, roots. Thigmotropism, I must write this down, is a touch response. So when you touch uh, some types of uh, ferns, they close up their fronds, and that's a uh, thigmotropism response. It's caused by movement of water, and that's kind of the same thing that uh, happens in Venus flytraps. We just have changes in water pressure, and that's how plants move. All right, plant defenses against herbivores. Here we have a, um, a caterpillar eating a plant, wound it. Single transduction pathway causes the release of uh, volatile attractants, causes parasitic wasps to kill off the, uh, the caterpillars. Now, if you're wondering how something like this could evolve, imagine a mutation to the plant that just releases chemicals in response to being damaged. Now, those chemicals sometimes probably didn't work so well in the past, but if the chemicals do attract something predatory, that's going to provide a huge survival advantage to that plant that can produce those chemicals in response to damage and definitely be selected for. All right, last thing we want to talk about is phytochromes. Phytochromes are a molecular switch that react to red light, and that's all we, we need to know about that. This ends part two of your notes on chapter 39, Plant Response.